Okay, well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Cyber Lecture. Um, last week I didn't have a chance to give a video lecture for this class because uh, things suddenly changed. Uh, as you know, um, we're not really sure exactly how the semester is going to go. I'm hoping that we will meet each other in class, but this is probably the medium we are going to have to use uh, for the time being and perhaps for the rest of the semester. I recently heard that universities in the United States, MIT in particular, is, uh, has decided to do their entire semester online. So things uh, haven't been decided about what will happen this semester for you, but um, I think it's necessary for me to talk to you in person like this, at least. Uh, so I would like to introduce myself. I am Professor Jeremy Sullivan, and this is Topics in British and American Culture. Uh, I've been teaching this class for almost five years. Um, part of the class has already been moved to a cyber lecture. I, I normally do one hour out of every three online. So all of you have already been to the website, it looks like, and you've seen the material that's there. So there's uh, three main components of the course. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I am from Canada, so I like to say that I'm kind of uh, part British and part American uh, in a way. Uh, I'm not uh, from either country, but uh, when I did my undergrad, I focused on British literature uh, in American literature. I didn't do that much Canadian lit and that's sort of what happens sometimes with uh, Canadians is we have a very strong influence from the British side and uh, obviously America influences every country, especially Canada, uh, profoundly. So I, I don't uh, pretend to be uh, a native of either country but I do feel like I've come across enough information to um, become an expert and uh, the, the textbook that we are using for this class uh, which I will be referring to this is, this is my library I don't think uh, any student has ever seen this this is my home library um, but this is the textbook that I asked you to buy um, which I was written by myself and uh, you know the inspiration for this was um, me being asked to do this course so um, I'll explain to you in a minute what the purpose of this course really is and uh, what the main idea of, of the textbook is but we will be closely following the textbook so this is one of the main components of the class um, <clears throat> I came to Korea 13 years ago and um, I I've worked at Chungnam for 11 years and um, this is um, where I've become comfortable, I think, mostly. Uh, this is uncomfortable. This is an uncomfortable environment. So, uh, I much prefer the classroom full of 75 students or 100 students that we normally have. Uh, but this class really, um, there's too many students for me to get to know you really well personally, for the most part, unless you decide to sit in the front row. So. This isn't going to be that bad for this class. It's it's already kind of adapted for a large audience and for you to just listen to me talk. So I'm going to do my best to imitate what I would do in the classroom. I don't have a really good web webcam yet. Uh, I heard that the English department is thinking about buying webcams for each professor so that we can provide a higher quality video lecture for you. For now, it's just a selfie stick stuck between a couple things pointed at me. I have a nice microphone so we'll we'll work on that if we end up uh, if we end up doing this for the entire semester I think you'll see a better quality video uh, a few weeks down the road but we'll deal with that when we get to it so for now this is what we have to do. Um, I also need a whiteboard so I can write things for you so that will, those things will be arranged and uh, we'll improve the virtual environment as we go. All the professors are trying to adapt and uh, I'm doing the same thing that they are, just trying to uh, figure out the best way to teach remotely, like 
uh, and for you to receive the best uh, education that you can. So you all know the coronavirus is spreading all over the world. It's super contagious. Please wear your masks when you go outside and avoid being in close contact with other people. Uh, that's very important. Uh, next week we're going to talk about, actually it's not next week, uh, there's, a, there's a makeup class so I'm going to uh, have to make an extra video lecture this week because as you know we started two weeks late. So March 2nd was the first day of class, was supposed to be the first day of class but that class was cancelled because we delayed the semester two weeks. So two days ago not two days ago. What day is this? Yesterday. This is Sunday. So uh, March 21st was the desig designated makeup day for March 2nd. So this week we're going to have actually two lectures because there's a makeup lecture. So this is the first one. This is week number two. Don't be confused. I'm sorry if it's confusing. But this week you need to log on and you need to do the makeup lecture and you need to do this one. So the, the second lecture will be, I will record it and send it and post it during the week and you have to check that one too. Um, just like the regular lectures, sorry, just like the regular lectures, the makeup lecture you will be able to log on uh, for one week. So it expires uh, on Sunday night just like week number two. So week number two and week number three are going to happen at the same time this week. Okay? So I want you to log on early in the week and listen to this, this video lecture I'm giving you now. And then uh, towards the end of the week, Thursday or Friday, I'm going to upload a second video lecture, um, which I would like you to watch and listen to and to check out week number three on the website. Okay, so this week we have a makeup lecture in addition to the regular lectures. So you need to log in twice, watch two. This is the first one of two this week. Okay, so I didn't really do a good job of introducing myself, but I can see the, the clock is ticking already. So. You'll get to know me as I do these vi video lectures and I'll, I'll talk about myself and I think that's probably good enough. I'm from Canada. I've been working here for about 10 years, 11 years. And um, this, is one of my, this is my favorite course to teach. It's also the hardest to teach, but it, it is my favorite. Uh, other courses are more fun, but this one, this is, um, I, I'm a big fan of cultural studies and I'm a big fan of history. So uh, the book was obviously painful to write, but um, the content I've always been interested in. So I hope my interest in, in the subject um, helps you be interested in it too. Um, so <clears throat> let's get into the content. Uh, the introduction that I asked you to read uh, from the textbook, most the, the main thing that I want you to understand from that is that I'm talking about British and American culture here and it's going to go, you know, in order of events. It's chronological. By chronological, I mean it's going to start at the beginning of British culture and it's going to move forward towards the present day. So we're going to start in, when I get to that today, we are going to talk about, you know, the BC era, the, um, the late Stone Age and the, the Celtic part of British culture first fairly briefly, <clears throat> and then we're going to rapidly go through the periods of different cultures that had influence uh, on British culture in the first millennium AD. Um, so to understand all the things that we talk about in the class, the introduction just suggests a few things uh, about cultural studies that are good for you to know. So um, first of all, the title of the textbook is Evolution Revolution. So everything we talk about in this class is really about the pace of change, how culture changes over time, but that it doesn't completely change and the, the leftover effects, the imprint of the previous cultures always remain to a, a greater or lesser extent. You, we're not going to argue about what's more important, uh, the Celtic 
culture, the Roman culture, the Anglo-Saxon culture, or any, any other number of influences, that's not the point. It's just to understand that all of those periods, those peoples, those events, uh, they contribute to what we understand British culture as being today. Um, from the Union Jack, you know, to King Arthur, all the symbols um, that you know of, the Beatles and um, Winston Churchill, Harry Potter, the Mini, Rolls Royce, etc., etc. It, go, it goes, the list is endless of all these people, and, and they don't live in a vacuum. They've all been affected by the people that come. And, they, and the, lots of individuals are very, very aware. Winston Churchill is a great example of a person who's very conscious of the history of, of the British Empire and history in general. And as he's making decisions, he's writing about himself and uh, sort of, I guess, exporting Britishness to the rest of the world as he goes. Um, and there's a lot of very, very influential individuals uh, that we need to talk about, and uh, we'll do so. And uh, I, I'm going to try and present you with things that are facts and things that are ideas and perspectives. And we, we put those two things together, and, and I'll be clear when I say that. It's like, well, this, this is a fact. This happened. We know this happened and uh, this is one way of looking at it and this is another way of looking at it and this is the way people looked at it a long time ago and this is the way we look at it now I think that's one of the best things about this course is you know um, the coronavirus situation is not unique I know we it is unique in some ways because we have a global transportation network and uh, the disease went from China to every country in the world in three months. That is unique. I'm not arguing that, but it's not the first time that we've had pandemics. There's a word pandemic already. We, the WHO said this is a pandemic because we already had a word for a disease that spreads all over the world. It's, it's happened many times. Um, so there are unique things about the coronavirus, but uh, when we do the makeup lecture, you'll see what I mean. We're going to talk about the Black Death, and uh, it's hard to explain to people what the Black Death is like until you live in a period where you have a pandemic. Like, that's what the Black Death was. Uh, it, it raced across the entire old world uh, from China to, to the United Kingdom. So we'll talk about that later, but what I mean is, what I mean to say is that um, Culture goes through changes, and we can see it right now. The coronavirus has sort of forced us almost into sort of a revolution mode. Uh, wars do this too. World War II is the last time, perhaps, that the whole world was kind of jolted into some sort of, you know, sudden revolutionary period. Uh, but they happen a lot, and um, but normally. Uh, the process is quite slow and that's why I use the word evolution so that's the root of the whole concept of the book is that some periods there's change that happens slowly and some periods there's rapid change which is called a revolution uh, to understand the individual things that we talk about I, I wrote about social context historical context and cultural context and this is just a sort of model to analyze anything, whether it's an event or it's an, a, a person or a thing. Uh, you can look at it and you can put it, uh, you can analyze it according to how it's related to its environment. So when you talk about social context of something, let's just talk about, I'll just pick something random, like uh, Abraham Lincoln. Well, Abraham Lincoln is a famous American president, and he had an obviously huge impact on the, the course of American history in the, in the Civil War. Most uh, Koreans and international students know who he is. So Abraham Lincoln, his social context would be to discuss about him in terms of what he did at the time. Even things like, okay, he was really tall, and he had... A, a 
fat, and uh, he was really, he was freakishly tall. He was very intelligent. He delivered speeches. Um, he was shot. All these things uh, happened in his life, and there, there were things that happened around him at the time. That's what we call social context. Um, historical context would be more along the lines of, okay, Lincoln did this, he did the Gettysburg Address in 1860, I think, I'm not going to be correct with this, 1861, um, that's a shot in the dark, it might be 60 or 62, but I think it's 61. Um, Abraham Lincoln did his Gettysburg Address, um, he selected this general and then the order of things that he did. Uh, he was born in a log cabin and then he grew up and then he became a lawyer and he, he ran, he became a politician in, uh, I'm going to get some of these things wrong, Illinois. The, the, the details are not essential at the, at the moment. The point is the order of things that they occur. So Abraham Lincoln did this and then he did this and then he did this. Uh, the, and this is the, the part that English majors, I like to know the details, but uh, some people hate the dates. And I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, the reason I'm fluffing the dates about Abraham Lincoln is because I don't really care to teach them to you and you don't want to know. Uh, you should know that the Civil War happened in the 1860s because that allows you to understand what happened before and what happened after. That's why everybody refers to the antebellum period, right? Um, which means that, you know, before the war um, and post-war, uh, pre-bellum, antebellum. So um, that's what historical context does for you, is put the sequence of, of uh, events in order. Whatever thing you're talking about, whether it's a person or not, you can say, if you're talking about a, the cathedral, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, you can say it was built this day and this happened after that and you know they they christened the sanctuary on this day and then uh, a bomb fell through it in World War II and these are all events that happen in a certain order. That's called historical context. Uh, cultural context is the ideas. So if you're going to talk about the Emancipation Proclamation, for example, or you're going to talk about Abraham Lincoln's politics, like he's a Republican and what he believed in and what he tried to accomplish, these are uh, based in ideas. These are things that are abstract, that are connected to the object, person, thing, event. And so then that they fall into the category of cultural context. So there you go. You can talk about Abraham Lincoln in the social aspect, the historical aspect, or the cultural aspect. And then it enables you to understand him better. Uh, and it, in, of course, it allows you to compare him to other presidents or um, compare him to leaders of other countries and so on. And, and that's the usefulness of, of that uh, strategy or that uh, model. So that's why it's in the textbook and I want you to understand um, the second model that I want you to know about just the perspective to, to help you understand what we're analyzing, what, what uh, content I'm trying to deliver to you and how to look at it. It's, the reason is I want you to know these things is because I'm going to teach you about British and American culture, but I want you to learn these ideas and I want you to apply them to your own country and your own situation. And, and look at the history of, you know, Bangladesh or Kazakhstan or Korea. Uh, I'm going to use a lot of Korean examples because I've lived in Canada for 25 years and Korea for 13. Don't add up, you know, the numbers because then you'll figure out my age. But um, that's the reason that I want you to understand it is because uh, I'm going to end up talking about Yi Shin here and there and uh, other people that I know in Korean history just because that helps you relate to um, the, the things that are happening, that have happened or are happening uh, around the world. And that's what uh, liberal arts education does for you. So I would like you to understand also that um, culture has sort of, culture is a gigantic thing. And if we were in class right now, I would be saying to you, 
you know, what, what is British culture or what is culture? We would, we would be, I would be asking you questions and you would be able to respond and people would say, a culture is art, culture is food, culture is clothing, culture is fashion, um, culture is sports, culture is language. Or one of my favorites is some students like to say, uh, culture is the way that we live. It's human beings interacting. Uh, that's, and that means everything, pretty much. And that's a great, uh, maybe that's a great definition. I think it's a great definition um, to work with because that's, that is really, it's a very wide net that you can catch with culture. When you say the word culture, you can mean particular things, but you can also sort of encompass everything. Like British culture means everything British. Uh, but you do have to distinguish between things that are, I guess you could say, super British or a little bit British. And we, we make those judgments all the time. Uh, so what is, how do you understand what is more British or what is less? I guess one thing you can do is to say, well, this part of the culture is dominant. And this culture is, this part of the culture is not. And the relationship between those two cultures is always... The, the, the larger, more powerful, more influential part of the culture sort of uh, pushes the other one down. Uh, so we call it a, 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 I wouldn't say push it down necessarily, but it dominates the other one. So we call it a dominant culture. And uh, the, the, the other culture that is not as strong and doesn't have as much influence, that is called a subculture. So they always have an interaction. Parts of culture always interact. I like to use the example of music. Uh, because music is something that usually popularity, uh, money and popularity are, are funnels sort of into the, the industry. And uh, it's pretty obvious that certain genres sort of, you know, pull other genres into them. It's almost like if you want to play different music, then you have to take a risk and you have to fight against that main thing, which in Korea would be K-pop, right? You know, if, if you want to uh, make a lot of money and you want to succeed, the best music type to go into is K-pop. We all know that, and BTS and they, all that stuff. But there's not just BTS, there's a there's hundred different groups and they all try and go into the same sort of category. Uh, if you want to do like punk or rap, even, although rap is pretty popular in Korea too, but you know what I mean, underground stuff, uh, they have to resist. They have to try and be different on purpose. And that's sometimes what they want to do. Art and music are good examples of where dominant and, col dominant and subculture kind of interact with each other naturally. And the types of art and music that resist and try to be different, we call them countercultures. So we're going to talk about a lot of things that, you know, there's going to be a dominant culture throughout this term, uh, American or British, that sort of tries to control everything and tries to exert its influence and, and use its power uh, to control whatever area we're talking about, whether it's economic or political or, you know, um, if it's related to art or something like that, there's, there's always going to be this powerful influence from the top called the dominant culture. And then there's going to be some cultures that are different, but they just exist and don't struggle against that dominant culture. They don't try to fight it and don't try to separate. And those are subcultures. Uh, and they, they have different kinds of relationships with the dominant culture, but it's not violent and it's not resistant. And then there's going to be these certain cultures that they do protest and sometimes those countercultures succeed. They sometimes overthrow the, the dominant culture and then they become the dominant culture. Like, you know, um, the Beatles, um, at the beginning at least, you know, rock and roll was sort of a, a countercultural movement. Um, Elvis and the Beatles made sure that it became the dominant one. And then after that, there was, you know, new types of music that made an effort to be different and, and tried not to be like rock music, like 
disco and rap and uh, heavy metal. So um, anyway, this class isn't going to focus too much on music. We're going to talk about all kinds of different aspects. Um, the like I said, the main the main idea, the main point of this class is to familiarize you with British and American culture and how the you know the process of cultural change created this uh, thing, the situation, this global English situation that we have now. And this is why we're, I'm talking to you in English. And this is why we have this class, is because this allows you to understand uh, where everything comes from. So <clears throat> let me just uh, use something this is one of the best things about the cyber, cyber lecture is that um, even though I can't see you in class and I don't have a computer and a projector or something, uh, you can still click on the links that I give you and you can play um, audio or you can watch video and uh, it can help you understand what I'm trying to say. So uh, the first week, you know, there's a few links there. I'm going to just quickly play a short clip of one of my favorite British songs of all time, including the Beatles and, and uh, Led Zeppelin and everybody else. I, I just think this song really captures something British. Uh, so I'll just play it quickly. I hope some of you listen to the links. Don't just uh, let the timer run out uh, because you want credit for attendance. Please listen to the links and watch the videos and and experience the, the culture that I'm trying to get you to be interested in. So, a quick uh, audio clip. So this is rural Britannia. It just feels like you're about to jump on a ship and go out, who knows what what sort of adventure or battle you are going to be involved in, but this is an operatic British song. It's when the chorus comes in that you really get the sense that it's the whole country has this pride in itself and this investment in in its own culture. That part. The horns and the chorus and everything singing together. Right. Um, so there's going to be stuff like that all the time. Um, sometimes it's going to be a documentary or sometimes it's going to be a song or maybe a video. Um, I'm. It's very Obviously, it's my personal choices of these things that you get to see. There's too much for me to cover, though. Um, we're already coming up on 30 minutes here, so this is what happens in the regular class, too. Is It takes a while to get through all the material, and uh, we only have so much time. And if I told you all I wanted to tell you, um, you never get to go home, or you'd never stop watching. So we do have to be selective. I do have to be selective about the things that I want to tell you, and uh, I, I will be honest, I've left a lot of important things out. I'm trying to hit all the major events and all the important things that I think are basic for you to know, and there's a lot of things that you can do beyond this course. I'm not pretending it's anything but an introduction to British and American culture. So let's quickly get into what I, the main point I want to talk about, uh, about the content of the course today. So this is week two now. Um, the culture that existed in, in the United Kingdom, uh, which was not the United Kingdom, it was just the island of, of Britain, right? Um, in the ancient period they called it Albion, and uh, Ireland was called Hibernia, and uh, those names sort of disappeared mostly into history because the later cultures sort of Put their own ideas on top of them but originally that was what it was referred to is Albion was the main island and to the west Ireland was called Hibernia. 
Um, the people that lived there uh, migrated uh, probably about 10,000 years ago. There's skeletons that have been found. Um, 10,000 years ago, there was the end of the Ice Age, so the English Channel, which is quite narrow, was almost like a bridge. So people could just walk across it, basically, and until about 10,000 years ago. So um, as the Earth got warmer, the people from Northern Europe just migrated across, and they just walked, as far as we know, anyway. They just walked across, and uh, then they were cut off as the, the ice melted and the water flowed in. Um, underneath the English Channel, there's a huge cliff, um, which used to be a gigantic waterfall, but now it's underneath the water. So the English Channel is, a is you can see, on a clear day, you can see across to France, or from France, you can see the cliffs of Dover in England. Um, so the distance is quite short, about 20 kilometers at its narrowest point. And it, it was a, a, bri a land bridge at one point. So that's where the people, you know, um, some, some parts of the earth, Africa in particular, human beings have lived there maybe millions of years. Uh, but England, about 10,000, give or take. Over 10,000 anyway. Um, so, you know, things progressed quite slowly there relative to other parts of the world because being an island was sort of a disadvantage when it came to um, technology and so on. So England, uh, Scotland, England, and Ireland, they were always lagging behind when Sumeria, you know, in Mesopotamia and uh, Africa, in Egypt, and China, and India, all those early civilizations started, you know, to consolidate themselves and to develop different technologies and cities and urbanized and agriculture and, and metal tools and everything where, you know, there was a lag in the islands uh, on the edge of the world. So, and, and that's really something you have to adjust to as a modern person is that the United Kingdom was on the fringe. It wasn't some sort of important island that everybody connected to and London was you know the center of the world's commerce and uh, industrial strength and uh, military power there was nothing like that uh, the centers of the world were in Egypt in Asia uh, even the rest of Europe was behind as well so coming right up to um, you know the the age the Christian the beginning of the Christian age the what we call 0 AD, when Jesus Christ was born. We still measure it that way. Usually we say common era now. So before the common era is BC, and after the after Jesus, the, the common era is CE now. Formerly we called it AD. I like to use AD because that's how I was taught when I was, grown up, when I was growing up. So anyway, um, in... About 50, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the exact date on this, but in the Julius Caesar's conquering of France, which was called Gaul at the time, he, he invaded um, Britain and he wrote a diary about what he did there around 50 BC. And um, he did that because the people that inhabited England uh, and Ireland and, and Scotland at the time, they were culturally related to the people in, in Belgium, uh, in France, the Gauls, the Belgiae, which is in Korean, how you say Belgium, Belgiae, um, in, in the northern parts of Europe, uh, those people had a, had a common bond in their, their cultural makeup and the way that they were organized. Um, so when Julius Caesar went there, the people that he met, they were, they were Celtic, they were Celts. Um, so what does that mean? The, the people that lived there, uh, the original people that inhabited the islands, they had developed a similar culture to the people in Northern Europe, uh, to the people that Julius Caesar essentially conquered and destroyed and turned into the Franks, into, the Fran into France. It, they evolved into France through their contact with Rome. So um, these people, you can imagine, when Julius Caesar got there, they were quite different than the Romans. They had long hair, uh, they tattooed themselves, um, they wore light clothing even though it was cold sometimes. Um, they were organized in tribes. Um, there was no 
empire like the Roman Empire. There was no, or Republic, there was no central government system. It was all tribes and confederations of tribes and villages uh, with their own leaders. And they were fighting each other often. And that's one of the reasons the Romans were able to um, conquer them. It's because the, the Celts, the, the people that we now refer to as the Britons, um, because the Romans called them that, those original people, they were disorganized and, well, they weren't disorganized. They were in smaller groups that were constantly uh, attacking each other. And, and so they couldn't really unify and, and uh, protect themselves and, against the Romans. Um, they did things like when they fought, they, they attacked people recklessly. They were great warriors individually, but they were not organized the way the Romans were. Uh, if, you, if you killed somebody in battle, and uh, you might do something like chop their head off and then carry the head around with you to let everybody know that they shouldn't mess with you. This is the kind of thing that the Romans thought was barbaric or savage. And, and so they had a lower opinion of the people there. Um, and they took advantage of their, their um, disunity um, and the conflict between the tribes to ally with some of them and fight and, and um, use certain people to fight other people. It's really similar in some ways to what happened in the Americas when uh, the English and the Spanish uh, went to the North America and South America and they made allies with certain natives to fight other native people and they ended up destroying each other and then the European uh, power took advantage of it. That's sort of what the Romans did too. So um, in around 50, if I'm going to get it right here, Cla came, uh, Emperor Claudius <clears throat> conquered in the, in the 50s AD, 57 AD, they invaded with a huge army and they conquered the entire uh, island um, up to the point basically of where Scotland and England are, have borders today. So in that area they called Britannia. So um, I just tell my students, I don't care if you remember 57 AD, what you need to remember is uh, at the beginning of the millennium, around zero AD we'll say, the Romans started invading and, the, and they, the conquest took decades. It didn't happen in one year or three months or something like that. They, the Romans got a foothold in the corner of England and gradually they conquered the whole thing. And then they built a wall called Hadrian's Wall about halfway up the island uh, and then they prevented, they controlled the flow of people from north to south and they, and they ruled for about 400 years. That's really the, the point. Um, so the Celts were there, and once the Romans took over and they occupied Britannia, which the future England and Great Britain, uh, once they occupied that area for 400 years, they really changed the way the whole culture worked. Um, the people that are there are ethnically Britons. They're, Keth they're Celtic, but their, their culture has changed. So we, we call them Romano Britons usually, but we'll just call them the Romans. They're the Romans who live in Britain. Um, ethnically, though, basically their culture has changed, but it's the same people genetically. Uh, over 90% of them are the same people that lived there the whole time. Some Romans came from Rome, some came from Italy and, and Gaul and other places and settled there, but the majority of them, they probably intermarried, and the majority of them are still Celtic genetically. They're the same people physically. Just culturally, they've become Roman because, you know, 15 generations go by um, behaving like Romans. So uh, the Romans, they come in, they do Roman things. They build roads, they build aqueducts, which have uh, running water, they build baths. Uh, there is a, a city, small city, um, called Bath, which does have a Roman bath built on an old Celtic site, which was uh, believed to be some sort of magical, um, you know, connection to the underworld. It's got some weird uh, minerals or chemicals in the water, so it's greenish. It's really beautiful. Everybody uh, who's interested in ancient history goes to that city to see Bath, where the, the Roman bath was built, and the, the ruins are still there. Surprisingly, 
or maybe not surprisingly, because it's an island, there's uh, Roman ruins everywhere. Uh, even in London, you can just walk around and you come out of a subway station and you're like, oh, there's a piece of a Roman wall. And there's a skyscraper. And there's a piece of a Roman wall. And there's a bus station. Uh, and London's cool like that. It's a really, the Londonimium, I can never say that word, the original London that was built by the Romans, um, that is the, um, the, that was the blueprint for modern London. So um, the city, there were very few things, you couldn't call them, there were towns, I guess, but not really. They were just collections of villages, and more of a rural, you know, pastoral uh, lifestyle in England until the Romans came there and, um, you know, the blueprint for London, the, the reimagining graphic of London has stuff like coliseums, race tracks, um, a barracks for 5,000 Roman legionnaires, that kind of stuff. That stuff never existed. So the population of this, this becomes ever after, even, even throughout the Dark Ages and the invasions and all the disruption afterwards, London becomes, because of the Romans, London becomes the center of British culture um, for the next 2,000 years. It continues to this day. Uh, it was the biggest city in the world in the 19th century. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the 19th century, rather, going into the 20th century. Um, so they la laid, I mean, the Romans laid the foundation for modern Britain right there. Uh, the garrisons, um, they shaved their faces. They had um, <clears throat> really sharp metal weapons. They built cities. They built aqueducts. They built baths and roads. And they imported lots of goods like wine um, from Roman territory. Uh, other things too. Spices came all the way from Asia into the Roman Empire and some of the wealthier Roman citizens would have got them in Britain too, which they would never have gotten before. So imported things. And of course the discipline. <clears throat> if you were a Romano-Briton, you wouldn't be running around with long hair and tattoos and an axe in somebody's head in your hand. Uh, you would shave, cut your hair, wear a toga, and if you were a, a fighter, you were a, a soldier, you'd be wearing a shield and have a, a Roman gladius um, and metal armor, and you'd be standing in line with other people, not uh, running around showing how brave and powerful you were as a fighter. So that's what the Romans did. Their period ended about 400 AD. 410 AD, they completely withdrew, and that left a huge vacuum of power. There was nobody organizing things in uh, Britain after that. So this gave an opportunity for all the tribes on the edges of that territory to attack. So the Irish and the Scots and the, the Picts and all these tribes came from Ireland and Scotland. They, they attacked quite a bit. Uh, the people who are now the Welsh, the Britons, they started attacking and the, um, really um, the Britons, they, they relied so much on the Romans that there was very little they could do to resist these people because the military was gone and the connections were gone and there was no government or organization to replace it. Uh, so <clears throat> after all these, this raiding started picking up speed, there were some famous pirates, you might call them. They're, they're kind of like early Vikings. They're pirates, um, tribes, uh, people, not really tribes, um, but groups of people <clears throat> that um, took advantage from Germany, uh, where Denmark is now in northern Germany. So the, the three people were the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, um, especially the Angles and the Saxons. They came over and they, they created uh, these kingdoms for themselves. They, they made, uh, initially they just attacked and took stuff and burned things and killed people, but <clears throat> they realized that maybe this would be a pretty easy place to, to invade and stay. So they started to push into uh, what we call England now. And the reason that we call it England is because the Angles called it Angeland, which is uh, the land of the Angles. And uh, in French it's Angleterre, which is English land, uh, Angle land, <clears throat> Anglais in French as well. So. That's where we get the idea of England from, is from these people. They sort of consolidated 
they didn't make one country initially. There was actually seven countries, uh, seven kingdoms rather, they're not countries, seven kingdoms that they created. Um, and uh, so they brought their language, they bought, brought their law, their customs. Um, they started writing down history. They were not Christian, but in, while they were making these kingdoms, they converted to Christianity. So the Angles uh, and the Saxons and the Jutes did that for England as well. They made it a Christian um, area. And it started to connect England to the rest. Ireland actually was already Christian and then England later. So gradually the kings became Christian and the rest of the people did too. So Christianity, uh, kings, language, law, customs, and history, that's all related to the Angles and the Saxons especially. So that is why, actually that's who I am basically. Uh, that's why we call the people uh, the ethnic group um, that the majority of people who have lived in England are called a, are called Anglo-Saxon uh, because they're a mixture of these two tribes. But it's really, I mean, you need a genetic test to determine how what part of you is what. But obviously, there's a lot of people that are part Irish, part Scottish, part Welsh, part Anglo, part Saxon, and so on. And that's probably what I am. It's it's really not. A, half Angle, half Saxon. That it's really not a, a very accurate term, but that is nonetheless what uh, for hundreds of years, going back more than hundreds of years, we're talking like a thousand years now, that we refer to the kingdoms that were established in England as the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms because six out of seven of them were Anglos, Angles and Saxons. Um, <clears throat> eventually, uh, those seven kingdoms were unified and they created England. Uh, there is a particular king named Alfred and um, he is very influential and important at this particular time but like I said this is a cultural studies class not a history class so we're not going to talk about Alfred today. Uh, I will talk about him next class when I talk about the Middle Ages uh, because that is where most of our information about him comes from because his uh, reputation was sort of recovered <clears throat> much later, uh, even after the medieval period. Uh, but he is one of the great kings, and he was uh, one of the Anglo-Saxon kings. So we'll talk about him next in the makeup lecture, or the following lecture if, if uh, we can't get to him. So, <clears throat> first we got the Celts. They're the ones that are there originally. We call them the Britons. It's a Celtic culture. Then the Romans come. They're there for 400 years, and they get kicked out. 400 AD. Then the Germans come, the German tribes being the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. They come in and they mix with the Britons, but they their culture takes over, so we call it the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, up until about 800 AD or so. And then we have this thing called the Viking Age starts to get going, and that's primarily the Danes, but also the Norwegians and the Swedes. Uh, but the Swedish kingdom gets stronger much later, so it's basically Denmark leading um, a group of people from some of them are from Norway, but the Danes the Danish kingdom is the strong one and uh, These people start taking over Anywhere that has Ocean near it so they they go to Normandy and they take over part of Normandy and they go to Sicily and They take over part of Italy and they go to the, the Middle East later and they take over You know part of the Holy Land uh, They're everywhere they go to Spain they go to Ireland they go to Iceland They go all the way to Canada they're everywhere. Uh, and part of the, the Viking Age is their terrorizing of the British, what will become the British. They're really Anglo-Saxon right now. But the Anglo-Saxons don't know what to do because uh, these Danes, this is about 800 AD, we'll say, um, they're, the, they're the last group we're going to talk about today. They have these things called long ships. And um, you can put dozens of of uh, Vikings, of Danes, in their rowing and with their equipment, uh, their weapons and their equipment in it and they can <clears throat> they can take these things in the ocean but they're very shallow and they're very flexible and light enough that you can actually if you have a lot enough people you can pick them up so they can go up rivers so they can come from anywhere from Norway, from Denmark, from Iceland, from Ireland, from Scotland, from France and they can just come show up out of nowhere, uh, and they, you just 
look out in the ocean and just say, oh, there's a ship, and then it comes right up the river uh, to your village and then burns everything down, kills everybody, and takes things. Um, originally, most of the Danes and the Norwegians and the Swedes, we don't really know why they're doing this, but probably there was um, over a population. They had sort of um, taken all the, you know, Norway has something like 5% of its land can grow stuff in a very short season. So they're really looking for something uh, a little bit nicer to maybe uh, take advantage of or to colonize. So they, they leave their homeland. There's probably competition in Norway and Denmark over these small amounts of land. So these warriors and these, these uh, sea kings, they're called, um, they attack all over the place. And um, you know, they, they show up, they, they particularly like to go after churches because churches have gold uh, ornaments, they have, uh, you know, clothing, expensive clothing, and they have books and all kinds of artifacts and stuff that are really expensive that they could trade for other things. They probably have food and alcohol and everything else. Um, so the, the, one of their favorite targets is churches and monasteries and abbeys and stuff like that. So they're, they're not Christian, these Danes. They go in and they just take advantage of everything they can. Eventually they start to almost take over all of England. And it's only Alfred, the king I mentioned uh, just five minutes ago, who is able to stop this flood of Vikings that starts taking over. So... Um, what do the Vikings represent? Um, <clears throat> they eventually start settling and they start mixing. They have these long ships. Uh, they fight. They appear suddenly. They attack. And they're very dangerous and scary. We call them berserkers. They kind of go crazy when they fight. And uh, they're very dangerous and they're very difficult to predict uh, and defend against. Alfred does a good job of doing that, but we'll talk about that later. Most of the kingdoms fall. And there's really just a corner of England that Alfred is able to hang on to and then starts to expand through his own military and organizational genius. But they basically take over almost all of England. The north of England is gone. Uh, it's totally occupied and, and um, that is called the Dane Law. Uh, that area, um, Danish law, is what everybody has to follow. Um, subsequent kings after Alfred pay them money to make them go away. So they take money, they, they bring their own words, they're master navigators, they go all the way across the Atlantic Ocean hundreds of years before Columbus. Um, they bring all their stories and their, their new words and they trade, they connect. Actually, they, they, bring, they don't just attack people and kill people, they also trade. And uh, in the east, they go all the way down the rivers and everything, all the way down to Turkey uh, through Russia. And, the, actually, the, the country of Russia is named after the Ruse, which is, the Ruse were originally a Viking uh, people, and they, they migrated. Uh, Kiev, Kiev, sorry, I'm not going to pronounce it right. Kiev, Kiev is the capital of Ukraine now. Originally, that was the capital of the, the sort of Russian Viking state that originally expanded. So they really, the Vikings expanded all over Northern Europe and into Eastern Europe and, and Western Europe and all the way into the Holy Land. It, it is called the Viking, Viking Age for a reason. Uh, that's where my green eyes come from. I, I'm sure one of my ancestors was a Viking who attacked somebody and, and uh, I'm descended from some of those people. If you see people with red hair and blonde hair and green eyes and blue eyes, there's probably some Viking blood in in those European people just like me. So they, they're a pretty, in general, pretty nasty people, but once they settle and they start to integrate with English people, they be, become settled and they become part of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom and they, they largely disappear. We, we do have a lots of influence from them in terms of uh, their, you know, um, certain words like berserker, for example, uh, or, or uh, Shield, the word shield. There's, <clears throat> there's, um, and a lot of the history and and stories that we have going back to that period are Danish. Like, if you've ever heard uh, Havelock the Dane or Beowulf, uh, some of the oldest stories in English 
history, um, the stories, the tales, the poems, they are heavily influenced. They've been Christianized, but originally they were sort of Viking lore that, that we now um, consider part of English history. But really, it's part of Viking history. And that's the point where we're going to stop um, for today. Uh, this is by far the longest video lecture I've ever done. So um, I'm sorry that it's a really long lecture, but I think this is what it's going to be like. Uh, in order for me to explain in detail so that when you read the book, uh, the book has a lot more words than I'm using. I'm just trying to condense everything into it looks like almost an hour long video for you to listen to so that when you read the book you can be like, oh, that's what Professor Sullivan was talking about. Um, the book has more information and it's more specific and what I'm talking about now is really just to collect everything from the cyber lecture, from the slides, and from the book. I don't know how this term is going to go. I don't think there's going to be quizzes. Um, at least it's not easy to do them with so many students. So I'm going to ask you to do an assignment. Uh, I've written the description on the, the internet already on the website. Uh, what you need to do is choose one of these cultures. Uh, and I want you to look up some information about the Celts, the Romans, the Germans, the Danes, or the Normans, which we'll talk about in the makeup lecture. Uh, 1066 is when William the Conqueror invades England and succeeds and the entire culture completely changes in a revolution. What I've been talking about to you today is really an evolution, not a revolution. But next class we're going to talk about the revolution aspect as William's Norman Knights, half Viking, half French you might say, they come in and they keep completely upend the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, turn them upside down and, and basically just put a Norman aristocracy on top of the culture that's already there and it suppresses um, the English culture for hundreds of years uh, not as long as you would think really because they get reabsorbed but in 1066 the new dominant culture is Norman and the counterculture or subculture both um, depending on what times you're talking about uh, becomes Anglo-Saxon so what I want you to do is choose one of those five cultures and I want you to look up some information and I want you to uh, write half a page to a page about uh, one of them. Uh, you can go beyond the course obviously. Don't copy anything. Don't paste something from a website or Wikipedia. That's not going to get you any marks. I'm going to give you zero for that. So look up some information. Um, Analyze it, write it in your own words, and email it to me. Uh, the information is going to be on the website. Please follow the instructions. That is due next week. Thank you for listening to me, and uh, we'll do this again. Thank you very much.